I'm Bob Challoner, the President and CEO of Southampton Hospital, and I'd like to welcome you to another edition of Focus on Southampton Hospital, our monthly television program about the goings-on and events at your community hospital. Today's guest is Noel Mick. Uh, Noel uh, will be sharing information about the gift of sight, and Noel comes to us from the iBank, which is based in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. Southampton Hospital has been working with uh, the iBank for quite a while. We'll hear that story and also um, we believe very strongly in promoting donations, uh, the gift of life donations and uh, we hope all of you will certainly consider uh, donation, uh, organ donation in your future planning. Um, so Noel, first of all let me uh, ask you a little bit about yourself and let's talk about the uh, your role at the iBank as, uh, as the Director of Education or? Uh, that's right, Bob. Um, I'm Director of Public and Professional Education at the iBank uh, for Site Restoration uh, in New York City. Uh, the iBank uh, serves the greater uh, New York City area, including uh, Southampton and upwards toward um, the northern uh, counties uh, north of New York City. So quite a large service area. Um, I have been there 20 some years uh, talking to people about the importance Just of... Just the blink of an eye, yeah, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's been right. fun. Right. Uh, talking about, uh, to people about the importance of uh, eye donation and uh, organ, eye, and tissue donation. And um, the eye bank for site restoration itself, of course, is uh, interestingly the world's first transplant agency uh, of all. And the iBank for site first transplant agency of all organ transplant of agencies. all uh, organ transplant agencies exactly. It was opened in uh, 1944 okay. in New York City at uh, Manhattan Eye and Throat Hospital, and uh, under uh, the direction of our town Lee Payton, uh, who uh, was a, a very uh, excellent ophthalmologist and cornea surgeon uh, at the time. And um, the need for uh, the eye bank, as we call it, uh, started in that cornea transplants were actually the very first successful human transplant. And they had been done as... <laughs> and this was what time frame? No. Well, successfully, the first cornea transplant was actually performed in 1905. 1905. And um, started in Europe, actually, with a, a physician there and had been done for many years in this country. What happened was uh, the need for safe donor tissue okay. became the issue uh, to have more and more cornea transplants performed. And it was Dr. Payton's vision to establish a system where that could happen, where there would be a supply of safe quality donor tissue for these transplants. And when, when you say safe, previously, what, what were the issues? They were just not handled appropriately, or sterility issues, or? Well, they may or may, they may have been safe enough, but I think that with the, the, the availability on a regular basis uh, was not necessarily um, at hand. And when we say safe now, a lot of eye banking that ensued once it was established um, is certainly dedicated to making sure that all tissue transplanted to a recipient is of safe quality tissue. And uh, clearly at that time before eye banking, it would be up to the individual surgeon to make sure as much as possible that that tissue was safe. I see, so this was an organization form to, to really ensure quality, control the process really from start to finish and... Uh, exactly, okay. that and, um, and availability. Prior to the eye bank for site restoration being established, uh, there was no real practice um, here in this country uh, or anywhere for people to donate uh, a part of themselves to be used by someone else after they died. Okay. There were autopsies. Um, there was donating your body to science for research but that was not going to be used by someone living after you weren't. So um, it required legislation okay. uh, at the time so that um, people could make this donation in advance, sign pledge cards at the time is what they did. And know that those pledge cards would be honored. And know that those pledge cards would be honored and after a fashion as we've come to know in modern uh, times or you know uh, as, as it would come to pass, it was very hard to identify 
if someone had signed a pledge card, which is why today the system is a little different. Now we have computerized registries okay. to make sure that when someone gives consent for donation, we have a better way of tracking that than looking for a donor card. And I know we'll get into that a little bit. And we'll mm -hmm. also hear from Dr. Louis Pizzarella, one of our ophthalmologists mm -hmm. um, who's affiliated with Southampton, who will be uh, talking about cornea transplant and why the work that you do is so important. But I, I do understand that Southampton already had a pre-existing relationship or a long history with the Eye Bank, which is a pretty interesting history. Uh, we do, and we've enjoyed a very long relationship, as you say. The Eye Bank itself uh, was founded in 1944 in New York City, but uh, we're and we're looking at our 70th anniversary coming up uh, in another year. Uh, but um, with Southampton Hospital, there's a 50th anniversary this year, and that's when Dr. Payton actually retired uh, out to Southampton, and um, he had already become known uh, in the field as the father of eye banking. Mm -hmm. And what he had done in creating this eye bank and advancing cornea transplantation had become known worldwide and he would host at Southampton Hospital a very popular conference among ophthalmologists that wanted to come to it um, every year uh, to not only work with him but of course to enjoy Southampton and, and all that you have to offer um, out here which we all know is great. So we never a problem at least in the summer. Not attracting uh, uh, surgeons to come uh, learn about cornea transplants and probably uh, I would guess maybe play some golf. I don't know. <laughs> just, just a little bit just with the doctors, exactly. <laughs> and it's interesting. I know Dr. Payton's uh, son, David Payton, is also in our in our community yes. and uh, uh, retired from the hospital as well at this point. Also an uh, ophthalmologist. Op also an ophthalmologist. Mm -hmm, exactly. And uh, we've always been very proud of our ophthalmology department here. Tell me a little bit um, more about the eye bank and how many, about on average, how many people do you help each year? Uh, well, we uh, collect tissue and supply it for approximately 1,100, wow. uh, 1,000 to 1,100 transplants each year. I mean, it, it sometimes varies, but I would say that's an average of the number of individuals that we uh, supply tissue for uh, transplants in our service area. Uh, there are other eye banks nationwide, and collectively um, there are probably 35 to 40, depending on a uh, uh, thousand a year, okay. uh, cornea transplants performed in the United States. So it is by far uh, the most common uh, and, and most successful transplant, transplant. Uh, being performed today. And the eye bank is uh, servicing all of the New York metropolitan area? or We do. We service all of the New York metropolitan area, and we work very hard to make people aware of the importance of eye donation, as right. you mentioned earlier, and uh, the ways that they can make that decision in advance uh, to be a donor and to register their wishes, uh, talk to their family, and sign up in the Donate Life Registry to be a donor. Let's talk about that a little bit. How, how do I sign up? What is that, what is that process? How do, how do you become an, a donor? There are a number of ways to do that, and um, primarily it involves um, a, a form, Mm -hmm. uh, and um, we print a brochure and it has uh, the Donate Life brochure on the back where an individual can state what they want to donate. This uh, enrollment form is located in a donor registry with the New York State Health Department okay. and it's called the New York State Donate Life Registry. It is not just for eye donation. You can uh, declare your wishes to donate organ, eye, and tissue. Uh, and you can access it by contacting the eye bank. Mm -hmm. uh, you can contact us by calling us at 212-742-9000 or you can access our website which is idonation.org. Okay. Or you can enroll in uh, the registry when you go to the motor vehicle department. That's another way when you go to DM. That was a question. I signed up when I, I got my license. I do. know it says organ donor. Does that mean I will I could potentially be a cornea donor? Absolutely. Okay. If you agreed to be an organ, eye, and tissue donor or an organ donor at DMV, uh, you will uh, most likely be eligible to also be an eye donor. And you can uh, state that, that those are your wishes when you go to DMV. 
and now more recently, you can also, when you enroll uh, and register to vote, okay. uh, that's another opportunity in New York State, oh, well, not necessarily nationwide, but in New York State, you can uh, sign up to be a donor when you uh, enroll to vote. And I have the ability to specify specific organs if I want my cornea versus not my heart, for example. I'm not sure why somebody would pick and choose, but someone may have a preference. So. Well, that's true. And um, you can specify to okay. answer that question. Absolutely. And there is an option on the uh, form, on the enrollment form, that asks if you want to uh, specify or if you would like to donate all organ, eye, and tissue or whatever is suitable uh, for donation. We like to remind people that everyone is different and it is very hard to determine in advance what anyone may or may not be able to donate at the time uh, when donation occurs. Um, for example, some people will, you know, we, we remind people uh, you can still be an eye donor even if you wear glasses. You right. do not have to have perfect vision to be an eye donor. That was going to be a question. Who can and who cannot be an eye donor, I guess? Almost anyone, really? actually. Almost anyone can be an eye donor. Uh, we generally uh, say up to the age of 75, <coughs> perhaps after that, um, the donation uh, may be used for research as opposed to transplantation. Mm -hmm. But again, it's a very individual uh, donation and these are things that are determined at the point of donation uh, by eye bank technicians. Um, oftentimes once we recover and can screen the tissue and um, evaluate it and then it's determined at that time uh, how the tissue can be used. So the technician would decide if somebody had a pre-existing disease or something that may have may limit their the suitability of the organ for use. So. Right, and, and as I said, there uh, sometimes are very little exclusions. Even people who have had previous eye surgeries uh, can uh, sometimes be uh, an eye donor for transplant. There are many new procedures now that um, our eye bank technicians and corneal surgeons use today to restore sight. And um, it may or may not um, affect what the tissue can be used for in terms of transplant, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the patient. So uh, we like to remind people that um, be generous, uh, consider what your eyes can do for others right. is part of our message and um, hopefully it will be determined at the time that you can restore sight up to two people uh, through eye donation. Amazing. Mm -hmm. And I, I know some people would think, well, my eyes can't be used by a donor. so. But certainly the research aspect and even training, training the next generation of doctors for, for organ use is, a, is important. I mean, that is a way to save lives. Exactly. In the future as well. And more likely than not, um, it's a very valuable donation. Absolutely so right. um, people shouldn't try to, shouldn't exclude themselves in advance exactly because right. they may have a, a very priceless gift to leave. Certainly, what a wonderful gift to give everyone. Exactly. Right. Tell me a little bit about the cornea, I know, is the clear covering over the eye. Um, what sorts of diseases um, are typically treated with a cornea transplant? Well, a cornea transplant, um, we should clarify also that um, eye donation and cornea transplants cure corneal blindness. Okay. Not all forms of blindness can be cured with a cornea transplant. Mm -hmm. Although, as you asked, certain diseases that affect the cornea might be uh, Fuchs dystrophy, which causes a uh, cloudiness mm -hmm. of the cornea. And uh, the cornea is the clear outer covering of the eye. It's a very thin tissue that's the outer covering of the eye. It must be clear okay. for good eyesight to, uh, to be had. Um, we, some people compare it to the crystal on a watch. Okay. Um, if that were scratched up or cloudy or whatever, you wouldn't uh, be able to use the watch. So right. this is why the cornea needs to be uh, clear and healthy for vision to occur. Uh, Fuchs dystrophy might cause a cloudy cornea. There's a disease called keratoconus, mm -hmm. and the word conus is uh, the tip off in that word. Um, it is actually a progressive eye disease that causes the cornea to become, over time, more and more cone-shaped. So, um, eventually, vision cannot even be corrected with 
um, a hard contact lens, which is a common treatment for it. Mm -hmm. If it becomes so cone-like um, that that uh, can't occur, only a human uh, donor tissue and a transplant would cure keratoconus. Um, I would assume so injuries, there are certain injuries into that can be a real cause of uh, cornea uh, problems. Exactly. Perforation, <coughs> uh, chemical burns, um, you know, people who work with, um, in, uh, with, with chemicals that might splash and cause scarring of the cornea. Again, anything that would cause opacity or uh, scarring of the cornea that would cloud it would require a cornea transplant to wonderful. repair. Certainly, mm -hmm. certainly sounds like a lot of, uh, lot of potential. What a, what a wonderful thing for somebody to have their sight restored. Of all the senses, uh, certainly vision is, is so, so important to all of us. So. And I, now that we've heard a little bit about uh, the eye bank and eye tissue donation, I'd like to uh, hear from Dr. Lou Pizzarella, who will be talking to us specifically about cornea transplant and how the eye bank has helped uh, with his efforts and other ophthalmologists to restore sight. Yeah, hi, I'm Dr. Lou Pizzarello. I'm an ophthalmologist here in Southampton. Uh, I've been practicing in Southampton since 1979 and have been affiliated with the hospital for that entire period of time. I am an ophthalmologist and that means I am an eye surgeon. I'm someone who can take care of all uh, diseases and conditions of the eye. In addition to that, I uh, perform surgery on the eye. And one of the operations we do is a corneal transplant. A corneal transplant is uh, the operation where we take a donor cornea, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that, and give it to a patient who's experienced blindness because of a corneal disease. The most common corneal diseases are ones you inherit, things like keratoconus or other rare ca causes of corneal disease, and then the corneal diseases that we acquire during life. Unfortunately, as we get older, we can develop a particular type of corneal disease called pseudophagic bullous keratopathy, and that's a real tongue twister. And what it means is that the cornea swells as we get older, and because the cornea is meant to be clear, and when it swells, it's no longer clear, we lose our sight. The only treatment for this condition is to give someone a new cornea. Now let me take a minute and tell you, show you some of the anatomy of the eye. Okay, now this is a model of the human eye, and uh, this is looking at the front of the eye. And if, if you notice this clear structure, that's called the cornea. And it's like the front of a camera. If this becomes clouded over, the image that goes to the back of the eye here, the retina, is blurred. And so all we're talking about today is surgery that involves replacing this cornea with a healthy cornea. Now, we do have the ability to use an artificial cornea, but those cases are extremely rare. So usually we transplant another human cornea to the eye in order to replace the corneal function. There are several ways we can do that. Traditionally, we would... Uh, cut out and remove the entire thickness of the cornea and then sew in a new cornea. More recently, in the last 10 years, we've learned the ability to just transplant the very back side of the cornea. This is a very thin layer of tissue and the advantage of that is there's no stitching involved so that the patient can get back to work and function much more readily. Now, corneal transplantation is the first organ that was ever transplanted from human to human. And Southampton Hospital is very much tied into the history of this procedure. The first corneal transplants were done early part of the 20th century. Patients would receive the cornea and frequently would uh, have corneas given from executed prisoners. But this system was cumbersome and uh, actually there were way more corneas needed than could be made available. And so Dr. Townley Payton developed the idea of an eye bank. That is a place where people could donate their corneas, who, uh, patients who had died, died, their family could do it, or they could will their corneas to science. And then these would then be used to treat individuals who needed corneal transplantation.
Now, I have a personal tie to Dr. Payton in that he gave me my first uh, pair of eyeglasses and was really the inspiration for me to go into uh, ophthalmology as a field. And I have a great picture of Dr. Payton here. This was taken in uh, 1982 and Dr. Payton at that time had never seen an implant done and so we invited him into the hospital at Southampton and uh, he watched me do the surgery. Uh, soon after that Dr. Payton uh, passed away unfortunately. In, uh, once they had, had the eye bank established it then became uh, uh, more readily available to have corneal tissue for implantation. And so there was uh, quite an explosion in the number of corneal transplants that were done. What's important to remember is we are all part of this issue. In that, you must remember that we can only help people who have corneal blindness if other people are willing to donate the corneas. And so I encourage all of you to fill out the little donor card with your license to let your family know that you're very, very anxious for this to happen. It's important to do ahead of time because unfortunately at time of death we have only a short window of time in order to retrieve the eyes. It's also important for you to know that when the eyes are removed it's not physically or cosmetically unpleasant uh, that uh, there are artificial eyes that are placed in, in lieu of the eye and so you don't have to worry about uh, some kind of a situation where the, a loved one is not uh, is scarred uh, after, after the eyes are removed. Once the eye is removed, it is then processed at the eye bank. In this case, our eye bank is in Manhattan. And then the uh, tissue is removed and preserved in a special solution that allows us to uh, use the tissue for up to a week to two weeks. Uh, depending uh, again, as I mentioned, on the severity of the corneal disease, we can either transplant the entire thickness of the cornea or just the uh, uh, inner layer of the cornea can be removed and then uh, transplanted to the individual who needs it. In our community, I'm the last surgeon left doing corneal transplantation and fortunately for us we have relatively few cases that need corneal surgery. Uh, in the given year, uh, I doubt we do more than one or two corneal transplants. Uh, some of these new technologies require equipment that we don't keep at our hospital, and so those patients are referred to other people at Stony Brook or in Manhattan who do these, uh, these new procedures. But in general, the procedures have been very successful, and it's important to remember that those who have donated eyes will really be helping others see again, and that's really the message that I want to get across today. Uh, I've been a member of the advisory board of the Eye Bank for many years, and have seen uh, the progress made there to keep up with the latest techniques in corneal transplant technology. Uh, fortunately now, because of a national network we have of, of donors, uh, patients do not wait very long in order to have a corneal transplant done. What's a little shocking to me is many of the corneas we get come from the Midwest where people are much more accepting of this and ready to donate their eyes for use to their fellows. Uh, it's really too bad that we don't have a better donation rate here in New York and uh, I think it's something that in a way is a bit shameful and that hopefully we can remedy by getting the word out in a show like this that it's very important that you complete that donor card and let your loved ones know that you're really anxious to have your uh, corneas used by others and any other organs that could be uh, valuable. Uh, corneal transplant surgery uh, in, uh, in uh, many ways has, has improved dramatically in the last 20 years. Uh, in general, the surgery is done as an outpatient. You don't spend the night in the hospital. Uh, no matter what technique is used, the patient's home that same evening. In general, sight can be restored very quickly in a week to two weeks in many cases. In the type where we have to transplant the entire corneal thickness, there are a number of stitches involved and those have to be removed six to 12 months after the surgery is performed. In the type of corneal transplant where you only need to transplant one layer of corneal tissue, those patients have really no stitches that have to be removed and their recovery time is, is, is quite quick in the order of three to four weeks.
The downside of this procedure is that it's more apt to be repeated than the, uh, than the one where we transplant the full donor cornea. Now, fortunately for us, the cornea has no blood vessels in it by and large, and this means that the risk of rejection of the organ is very low. This is good news because unlike a kidney transplant or heart transplant where you'll talk to patients who have to take anti-rejection medicines for many months, if not years, in corneal transplant, by and large, we really don't have a problem with rejection. It can occur, but it's nowhere near as common as it is in the other organ transplantations. And as a result of that, uh, the a number of medicines and drops patients take is, is not all that, all that much. Again, ophthalmology, as it has in many areas, has really led the rest of the fields of medicine in developing these corneal, these transplantation techniques and then having them uh, be used in the other specialties. There are many people who have eye injuries, and mostly these are injuries, that are so severe that we cannot transplant a human cornea to these patients. And so there has been uh, really a long-term effort now, over 40 years, to develop an artificial cornea. And this has been done successfully in a number of different ways. Uh, a, the uh, cornea is reproduced in a clear plastic, and uh, the uh, clear plastic material is then sewn into the eye. Uh, you can ask, well, why, do we, why don't we just use artificial corneas in general? And the problem with it is that it's much more complicated surgery. And the field of vision that the patient has is extremely limited. And so we only use these artificial corneas at this time in those very, very desperate cases where the only alternative is blindness and where a normal human cornea cannot be transplanted. Now, going forward, work continues on developing an artificial cornea that would replace the human donation. Uh, this is a very complicated area. It will be, I think, quite a while before we have an artificial cornea. I think sooner may be the development of a, a cornea that we manufacture, so to speak, using stem cell technology to develop an artificial cornea that would uh, replace the human donation. But again, that's many years away. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Pezzarella, for, uh, for your discussion. And also, particularly, thank you for the great work you do with our community and the patients in our community. And, and, and back to you, Noel. I just, uh, any, anything else that you'd like to say about the iBank and uh, any other groups of patients that we're, we're serving? Well, you know, through the years, um, since Dr. Payton founded the iBank back in 1944, um, we have had close to 60,000 uh, men, women, and children who have had their sight restored uh, thanks to cornea transplants and the work that he started in our ongoing mission at the iBank. And these recipients can be uh, people of all ages, um, from as young as infants and babies, um, to people 90, 92 years old who have had their sight restored and can maintain their independence. So it really is just uh, an amazing uh, type of effort that, as you indicated before, what could be more priceless than uh, the gift of sight and to receive it. Um, you also mentioned um, the idea that uh, not just disease but accidents uh, can occur mm -hmm. that would require someone to need a cornea transplant. So you really never know um, who in your life or even if yourself um, might require this type of gift. Um, our Thanksgiving card this year actually um, that I brought to share with you um, is um, was created by a six-year-old wow. uh, transplant Amazing. recipient. Um, and she, as you can tell, is a very artistic and craft-oriented sure. uh, young lady. And sadly enough, she did have an accident with scissors mm. and was doing crafts and um, injured her eye. Wow. And that's, um, they were blunt scissors. Um, even they can, uh, you know, Understand damage that. the eye if uh, not uh, handled properly, and this was an accident. But luckily, her sight was restored with a cornea transplant, and this card was created after her transplant to show how uh, grateful she was to her recipient, and she understands that someone left her this type of gift that helped her to see again. And so this is an example of um, the gratitude and 
um, what our recipients feel when people consider donation uh, to leave someone the gift of sight is always very gratefully received by that individual and their families. That's a wonderful story and just to think that somebody at the end of their life was able to restore sight for a child, a young budding artist who otherwise might have had a life exactly. of blindness. Just absolutely amazing story. Thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. And I'd like to thank you, Noel, and uh, Dr. Pizzarella for the wonderful work that you're doing <clears throat> in sharing this information today with our audience. And, and to learn more about the iBank, please visit www.idonation.org or call 212-742-9000. Um, those numbers I know and website will be displayed. And also, please remember you can become an organ donor by registering online at www.donatelife.net or call 804-377-3580. I'd like to thank everyone for watching today. Please consider organ donation. It is vital in the good work that everyone is trying to do in saving and, and preserving life. And I'd like to thank our friends here at CTV for producing this show this month and always and our friends at LTV for airing in East Hampton for all of you for watching please feel free to call my office if you have any questions concerns or need help navigating our health system here on the East End 631-726-8555 thank you everyone and good health